Hey guys, I'm Sam, that's the Sun Eater, and this is normally a YouTube channel where we look at all the aspects pertaining to how to add solar power generation onto a vehicle. But creating onboard solar power for our vehicle was not the only problem that we need a sustainable solution for. We also wanted to be able to utilize some of the land that we have to make our own food, which is why today's video is going to be about everything that's going on over there, including rain catchment, automated garden watering, raised garden beds, and standing water management solutions. So let's go take a look at all this stuff that's been off camera for so long. We started building all these gardens when we moved into the house about five years ago. We went with raised garden beds because they allow you to control the moisture level in the soil. They greatly reduce the amount of weeding that you have to do because not as many seeds from grass or other things blow in there. And they help you manage pests, including the occasional inquisitive rabbit. Um, but right after we started building these gardens, nature threw us a curveball. Uh, Dallas had its wettest year ever about five years ago, and they had the second wettest one about three years ago. Texas has been getting steadily a lot wetter. And that increased rainfall caused there to be almost constant standing water in this area right here, right where we were, had already started building all the gardens, for almost two months a year. Standing water was causing a number of problems. It started rotting out some of the wood at the base of the gardens where they were always in the water. Um, mosquitoes were becoming a problem and the and mud would get tracked back into the house either on the soles of our boots or on the paws of the dogs or on the whole dog. Um, so we needed a way to reduce the amount of standing water over an area of almost a thousand square feet. So how did we do that? Well the first thing I thought is if we can, if all the water that's there is coming from the rain, maybe we can catch some of the rain and store it and release it into the, the area at a slower pace so it doesn't turn into a constant flood. So the first thing I tried was a rain catchment system. So let's take a look at some of the engineering behind a rain catchment system. This is our rain catch. I carved a terrace into the hillside here and laid some bricks down so that these things wouldn't sink down into the hill because they actually weigh 2,000 pounds apiece when they're filled with water. Each one of these totes holds 300 gallons, so that's 1,200 gallons of rain that we can keep from puddling around those gardens every time that it rains. I put restrictors on the other gutter downspouts and I hooked that one up there up to 3 inch PVC which feeds into the top of these totes and disperses throughout all four of them when it rains. There's also an overflow there so that they don't explode or basically spill back out on the top of the house if we get more than 1200 gallons of rain uh, in a single downpour. Now you can actually we didn't have a spigot on the back of the house, so when we wanted water back here, it was actually kind of difficult to get. But the gravity alone will give you enough pressure where you've actually got a pretty good watering system back here just using gravity. None of this is city water pressure right here. And because there's so much gravity pressure, this system has a, a pretty good other utility to it. We can hook these watering, uh, the rain catchment totes, up to this little valve that opens once uh, once a day or twice a day, you can set it to, to open up or close as many times as you want. And so now, this rain catchment system, in addition to reducing the amount of standing water, can water all of our gardens and our fruit trees for us uh, once or twice a day as needed just by using this little $10 valve. I'll include a link to it in the video description if you want to build something like this. And this hose right here runs to splitters that run to all four of the gardens. And I've snaked these drip hoses through the gardens. So in months like July, now not only does the tote solve the standing water problem, but it also waters my garden for me automatically for about an hour and a half a day. And without that, honestly, all this would be dead because I'm not here every day to water the gardens. And even if I was, it's just too easy to forget. And if you forget to water one day in July, with it being 105 degrees outside, 
most of what you got is going to be toast. So the rain catch catchment was a home run. Um, it holds a ton of water. It waters the gardens for us, but it didn't completely by itself solve the standing water problem. Even catching 1,200 gallons of rainwater, we were just getting such downpours that there would still be a large amount of standing water and mud throughout much of the backyard. We needed a solution in addition to the rain totes that would be able to take care of all the rest of the standing water, and it was thousands and thousands of gallons. Now, normally, you would use French drains, those, you know, the subterranean kind of perforated pipes to carry water away from an area. When you get standing water like that, that's very common. But when the area that you need to drain is flat, French drains don't work because they have to have a small gradient in them to, kick, to use gravity to carry the water away from an area. The area we were trying to drain is obviously flat. So we needed a solution where we could take thousands of gallons of water out of an area using these French drains. Uh, here's how I did it. Okay, the first step was to dig out the canal that the French drain was going to go in that was going to pull out all the water out of this area. Next, we had to excavate the entire area around the gardens down to a depth of about four inches and fill that in with gravel uh, to facilitate water draining through that area into that drain that was going to carry it out. Uh, once we got away from the gardens, I was able to work with an excavator that I rented and dug a drain about, oh, I'd say 75 feet back onto the property. And then I got another one of those rain totes that you saw in the rain catchment system. And I actually ran the drain into that, which I buried. Um, for, the, for the access port that I'm going to drop the pump into, I wanted to use a 12 inch PVC pipe, just because it would look more professional and a little better. But that pipe actually wound up being really expensive. It was going to be like 150 bucks to get just a, like two or three feet of 12 inch PVC and a cap for it. Um, so we got creative, went to the hardware store and actually found a little uh, Gatorade cooler that was like 20 bucks. So we just cut that in half and that gave us a great access port on the top of that tote to drop the pump into. Uh, buried everything with the excavator and what you're left with when it's all said and done is just this one little kind of access port sticking out of the grass that you can unscrew, drop your pump down in there, and run the hose, you know, three, four hundred feet away. As long as you have a water sink, some place to put the water, be it um, like a storm drain or a creek or even just the woods behind your house, as long as you have somewhere to move it to, this system will work to drain standing water out of any flat property or if you have like a, a low-lying area that you want to drain. As long as you have somewhere to pump the water to, this system will work. We've had some very heavy rain since we installed it and we went out to the garden the next day and the whole yard is totally still dry and you can walk on it. There's no, the swamp is gone, finally. One quick update on this. About uh, a month after I buried it the first time, I noticed that the sides of the cistern, the tote that I buried in the ground, were kind of starting to collapse in on themselves. What happens is, as the dirt, as it rains on it, and that dirt settles on there, it starts pushing in on that thick plastic buried tote. I thought that it, the walls of it were thick enough to have a structural integrity to be able to resist that, but I was definitely wrong. So if you build one of these, make sure that you build like a shell outside of that tote and drill some very small holes in it so that water can flow through it, but that dirt and other stuff can't settle in on it and basically crush that buried cistern. It's got to have some kind of shell around it. Um, so yeah, I'm going to have to go back and dig that thing up and build a shell around it and bury it again. That'll be a pain in the butt. But other than that, um, the install went great and it's been working perfectly. So we've taken this 30 by 40 foot area We've built a rain catch. We can use it to automatically water the gardens. We've got our flood water management system that's literally underneath of our feet right now. We've got 200 square feet of raised garden beds and four fruit trees. That's gotta be as much as we can do with this area, right? Not quite. There's a new emerging agricultural uh, experiment going on called agrivoltaics. 
which is where farmers will actually put solar panels on top of the food that they're growing and to shield it from that high noon and afternoon sun, basically to give the plants a little break from just the direct sunlight. It's 105 outside, but like directly in the sun, these plants can get up to uh, you know 115 degrees. You can even see over here where the afternoon sun is still hitting them, where they look a little wilted. And they've started coming back with some, some hard numbers on what kind of production benefits they can get from this. And they've actually seen it in crops like cherry tomatoes, the, out the yield of the crop actually double when you intersperse some shade over it. And it, get, it does another very important thing for a small farm. Small farms really only get one or two paychecks a year. And if they get like a, a late freeze or a bad insect infestation, it can wipe them out. If they can put these solar panels over their farms too, they have an additional source of income. It would be a huge boost in stability for them, for them to be able to make some kind of other money off that land and help them stay afloat when they have a bad year. So we've got the battery in that leaf. It's not going to last us a whole lot longer. That's going to get turned into a home power wall. But also over this last garden over here, the one that gets the least shade out of all of them, I'm going to build a steel truss that's about seven feet tall. We're going to put solar panels on the top of it and run that power to our EV battery that's getting turned into a power wall and we're going to build our own agrivoltaic system down here. So we'll stack the utility of that on top of everything else we've got going on around here and really hyper utilize this land resource that we have. And when you think about it, we really waste a lot of money on just having a grass yard. Um, we have to water it, we have to cut it, we spend, you pay a lot more for a home, for a house that has a lot attached to it, but it really doesn't do anything for us. And here inside this little 30 by 40 foot area, we've managed to make so much utility, food production, flood water management, rain catchment, power generation soon. And so this kind of hyper utilization of this resource that we haven't, you don't really use at all now when we just let grass grow on it, is, is something I'm, I'm looking forward to experimenting with and I'll keep you guys updated uh, with a few videos on it. Okay, so that's it for the video today. I hope you guys liked it. I hope it, um, if you're having a, a real serious problem with standing water on your property, I hope the cistern drainage system I developed kind of helps you guys out. Um, we'll be back in a couple weeks with some more updates on the solar car and more improvements that we're making to that. I just wanted to uh, close the video out with a little shot of the watermelon patch here that's gone totally AWOL. Uh, we start out with a couple little three inch plants that went in the ground right here and it is since almost completely taken over this part of the garden uh, so if you don't think that you can make a whole lot of food using only uh, 30 feet by 30 feet and a couple of raised garden beds think again all right that's all i got i'll see you guys next week